And as I said, I will start with point nine, because prayer relates to everything in our lives. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. God, yeah, tell God what you need and thank him for everything that he has done for you. In Philippians 4, 6, Paul writes, actually, it's not there. He did not write in Philippians 4, 6, pray about it. That's not what Paul says. He was too wise to do that. He uses three different words to describe right praying. Prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Right praying involves all three tied together. The word prayer is the general word for making requests known to the Lord. It carries the idea of adoration, devotion, and worship. Whenever we find ourselves worrying, our first action ought to be to get alone with God and worship him. Remember all the things that he has done for you. Remember who he is. Worship him. Adoration is what is needed. We must see the greatness and the majesty of God. We must realize that he is big enough to solve all of our problems. Too often we rush into his presence and quickly tell him our needs when we ought to approach his throne calmly and in deep reverence, remembering who he is and what he has done. So the first step in right praying is adoration. The second is supplication, an earnest sharing of our needs and our problems. There's no place for half-hearted, insincere prayer. While we know we are not heard for our much speaking, still we realize that our Father wants us to be earnest in our asking not have a prayer list just because these are things that people should pray for, but because our heart cares about them. The way Jesus prayed in the garden, while his closest disciples were sleeping, Jesus was sweating great drops of blood. Supplication is not a matter of energy, but of spiritual intensity. After adoration and supplication comes appreciation, giving thanks to God. Certainly the father enjoys hearing his children say, thank you. When Jesus healed 10 lepers, only one of the 10 returned to give thanks. And we wonder if the percentage is any higher today. We are eager to ask but slow to appreciate. You'll notice that right praying is not something every Christian can do immediately because right praying depends on the right frame of mind. This is why Paul's formula for peace is found at the end of Philippians and not at the beginning. If we have the single mind of Philippians 1, then we can give adoration. How can a double-minded person ever praise God? They're so, you know, this or that, that they don't zone in. If we have the submissive mind of Philippians 2, we can come with supplication. Would a person with a proud mind lower themselves to ask God for something? If you have the spiritual mind of Philippians 3, we can show our appreciation. 
a worldly-minded person would not know that God had given him anything to appreciate. But we, as his children, know how much God has given to us and those around us that we can thank him for. In other words, we must practice Philippians 1, 2, and 3 if we are going to experience the secure mind of Philippians 4. Paul tells us to take everything to God in prayer. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything is his admonition. We are prone to pray about the big things in life and forget to pray about the so-called little things until they grow and they become big things. Talking to God about everything that concerns us and him is the first step toward victory over worry. The result is that the peace of God guards the heart and the mind. You will remember that Paul was changed to a Roman soldier, guarded day and night. In like manner, the peace of God stands guard over the two areas that create worry. Our hearts, when we have wrong feelings, and our minds when we have wrong thinking. When we give our hearts to Christ in salvation, we experience peace with God. But the peace with God takes us a step farther into his blessings. This does not mean the absence of trials on the outside, but it does mean a quiet confidence within, regardless of circumstances, people, or things. And when we tell God about those trials that are out there bothering us, his spirit will plant the peace when our, within our hearts. Verse 8 continues telling us what we put into our minds determines what comes out in our words and actions. What we have put before the Lord in prayer will make a difference in how we approach the rest of the day. In addition to the prayer, Paul tells us to program our minds with thoughts that are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and worthy of praise. And those can all be brought to the front through prayer. The number 10, because the promises of God are the basis of our prayers. Psalm 119.49 tells us to remember your promise to me, for it is my only hope. Remembering is not just recalling, for God never forgets. The psalmist is asking God to relate to his people in a special way. God wants to relate to each one of us in a special way, but in order to do that, we have to want to relate to him in that special way. The psalmist prayed that God would use his word to work on his behalf. The writer had hope because of the promises that God had given to him, and he prayed that those promises would be fulfilled. When Daniel found in the prophecy of Jeremiah the promise of Israel's deliverance from captivity, he immediately began to pray for the promise to be fulfilled. So maybe there are promises out there that we can remember that God has given us that we need to start asking him to fulfill. True faith not only believes the promises, but also prays for God to fulfill, to work out these promises. In his believing and praying, the psalmist found encouragement or comfort, for the Latin word means with strength. And he did not abandon his faith or run away from his problems. He was revived with new life, remembering God's promises and asking God to fulfill them. Isaiah 65, 24. 
the promise that we will conclude with. I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking to me about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers.